uh, is one of the founding members of uh, architecture, Architects Without Borders in Portugal. So I give the floor to João. Thank you. So thank you very much for the invitation for our, our organization of the um, festivals and special Maria. Um, very glad to be here and to uh, present uh, this uh, this work uh, that is uh, that is from Manuel Vicente and it's it's about the the, the Prague Grants uh, plan. Um, so I will. I will start immediately because I have a, a lot of slides to show and I need to go on a, on a fast track. Okay, and, um, and uh, I, will, uh, I, I will need to run. So I will start with a brief uh, historical approach to put in context the, um, the plan that I then will uh, describe to you. So uh, 1792, Macau is a small peninsula under, a Portuguese, under the Portuguese administration and is characterized by a beautiful bay already, uh, a dense urban area, as you see, I'm gonna point it out here, a dense urban area and farmlands in the north of, of the peninsula. So at this, at this, um, uh, at this, in this map, you see already reclamations. So reclamation started very early in Macau. This is all reclaimed and this is all reclaimed as well. Okay, so 120 years later, what we have is that the farmlands have been uh, divided in lots, so it started to be urbanized, and the reclamations also took place and uh, ex actually expanded a little further. But the bay still stays here very beautifully, very clear, mm -hmm. and um, can you see the pointer? Oh, yeah. And, and, and actually the bay f uh, works uh, as a um, institutional uh, facade f uh, of, of the city. So, um, <clears throat> we jump to 1941. At this point we see, um, we see San Malo that was laid out in 1920 that is, uh, which purpose was to uh, connect the inner harbor to the outer harbor. And we saw a lot of, of the area that is uh, reclaimed already in front of the bay. And, and of course, the, all the development of the northern parts are already urbanized, built, and other, uh, other areas have been also reclaimed. So then we jump to 1991. This is pretty much what we have uh, now. Not really, but I will explain later. And, uh, <clears throat> and this is the highlight of Manuel Vicente's plan, Area of Intervention. The plan was published officially in, uh, in the Gazette in 1991. And um, it was due to a competition in 1982 uh, for the for the area, so it was already uh, the intention of the government to actually uh, link the inner harbor to the outer harbor by producing uh, some sort of of dig of uh, of uh, an extension of uh, land and uh, letting the, the the lakes or producing the lakes. So therefore, um, this competition, among other architects, we have. The renowned, we have the renowned architect Cesar Vieira, uh, we have architect José Luis Iglesias, and, and the winner was architect Manuel Vicente. Mm -hmm. So, who was Manuel Vicente? He's, this, he's a, he was a very um, complex uh, persona, uh, but I would put it this way. Manuel Vicente is a poet of space, where the rhyme is, is interpretation of cityscape into his architecture, and the verse is the constellation of his vision given to humanity. Does that make sense? It makes to me, okay. Right, so um, further ahead. This is one of the first sketches but done by Manuel Vicente to grab this area according to his uh, concept 
and um, and it shows already the lakes, the, intersect the intersection of geometries, the concern of resolving some of the flows of the city, the resolving also public spaces versus built spaces, and um, and this is one of the first models based on that first idea. Um, this project was ongoing on his office for 20 years, so there was different phases and um, there was a constant revisiting of this project. At this time, for instance, there was a geometric uh, outline that, that changed to actually preserve the curve of the bay, the original curve of the bay, I would say. So this is the, the original curve of the bay, as you see. And this uh, geometric outline also embraces the city, the existing city. So Manuel Vicente was looking at the city itself, what it exists, and giving the opportunity for the same city to expand in a more natural way. <laughs> So then this was the result of that uh, geometric approach. As you see, in the center core, there was space for entertainment, leisure, sports, but also buildings in this area. So residential, office, etc., etc. So this is then uh, I'm sorry, I didn't give you time to read uh, Manuel Vicente's uh, own words. Um, I don't think I need to read unless you need me to read you translate. No need. Well, I'll read and you translate then. Praia Grande is still and above all the big popular place where life of the city occurs multimodal in the motives and destinations. From obligation to devotion, from necessity to pleasure, from urgency to contemplation. This was the part of this the design narrative uh, for the competition. And we, we can see that his approach is really to give another facade to the city, to give a more uh, a reflex of the city itself. And, and, and to provide, and to provide uh, 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 the existing shoreline to be maintained. Okay, so maybe some years later, I'm not that sure. And maybe due to government uh, requests, the, the plan has, has changed and it has evolved to a more dense urban area especially in the core, in the core, in the center core. So basically now what we have is, is the, an, a new area here that is connected, adjacent to the reclaimed previously in the 40s. We have, uh, we have an, an area that is, a, um, let's say, a, a walk onto a more dense area that is, uh, which purpose is a, a more institutional, uh, and government buildings. And then we have part of this plan that meanwhile was by, uh, won by another architect, Cesar Vieira, and uh, Manuel Vicente actually has extended to, the, to, his, to this purpose. So this is the geometry again, the new geometry of this place, and <clears throat> now divided into zones. Uh, so zone A, for instance, is this area where you uh, actually is pretty much built. You see that office buildings are on the back and there was an hotel, one or two hotels and then the um, residential on the, on, the front, on the front line. Then all this uh, leisure playing here on these areas, leisure and entertainment, office buildings, um, government buildings and um, and the extension of the set plan. So this is a perspective made in the first computers in the office of Manuel Vicente. 
this uh, is uh, pretty much from the 90s, beginning of the 90s, I would say. And this is a perspective made by a developer with uh, his, their uh, hand-painted artists that they used to have at the time. So here you very much see the layout, the, 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 the layout and, and, and the, the volumetric of the city. Pretty much, pretty much you see what is built today. So this is all residents, so it's very grateful to have the residential buildings facing the sea, as opposed to a more uh, office buildings that are on, on, on setback. And then you see all the uh, low, very low dense area, although in, this, uh, in these zones, uh, to then have a punctu to punctuate with two towers that some, somehow welcome the entrance of this uh, new area. Okay, so this was then the plan during the construction and the reclamation period, which was in the 90s. So pretty much this was in 1995 or 96. And again, uh, zone A under construction with some of the office towers already built by the time. So it's missing here one of the residential blocks that would stand here. And the comparison between 1930s and the 2000s already with uh, some, um, uh, some developments such as the Macau Tower that was not originally in the plan and this new plaza that was uh, designed uh, after but, but uh, had, had won a gold medal in the Arcasia. And, um, and, and then an, just another aspect of the graceful plan that, that it's really integrated into the city and one feels that it's really integrated into the city. Uh, here, uh, so I will read again. We have planned prior grant in the course of the city and in the course of history, unveiling the capital situation of the bay. So still nowadays, what you see is the reminiscence of the, of the curve is still there. You can still feel it 30 years later. As you walk today on, on the, on the seawall, along the seawall, the trees were maintained. They still a barrier, still a frontier from, from the cars to the to a more higher and uh, uh, pleasant, pleasant area to walk. And where that was not possible, uh, some trace of the wall was kept or was done right after. Again, Manuel Vicente on his... Uh, uh, almost finished uh, your, your Almost time. finished? Yes, okay. just two minutes more. Two huh? minutes. Okay, just some comparison between what, you know, what, what he had. And here uh, I would say that the, the public space, the pl public space takes place on the reminiscence of uh, St. Peter's Fort with these triangular shapes. So the urban space is so much important. Uh, so uh, Henri Lefebvre, the French philosopher, elaborated about the production of space. And um, he argues that every society produces a certain space as of its own. So we believe that this space was built spe specifically for Macau to embrace Macau. 2003, this is layout plan, photo, aerial photo. This is nowadays and new areas that were not considered in the plan are located in red. So the plan has not been kept well. It, it has not fully developed in this already with uh, punctuated with things that are not uh, able to, that are colliding with the initial, in, initial, initial idea. This is my last slide. 
This is the new urban reclamation areas, the plan that was presented by the central government in 2009. After three co public consultations, uh, um, I have uh, a few considerations to make. First of all, there is no law or regulation that says that the public consultation result should be integrated into the plan. Second, a city is always the reflex of the society. If we recognize that the market is not a good urban planner, then we need to understand that in a market economy, there are things that cannot be left to the market. I'm not sure if this wants to reflect our society the way Henri Lefebvre has put it. Thank you. That's all. Thank you, Joao. Now I pass the floor to, to our next speaker. Xiu Wing is a postdoctoral researcher in the field of urban development and uh, heritage preservation. She's a member of ECOMOS, so I met her during the regular meetings of um, ECOMOS. Uh, she lives in Wuhan. Uh, she works in Wuhan Research Center on shared built heritage. Uh, is uh, included in UNESCO. Uh, she's now researching mainly about the city of Wuhan. So she will tell us about uh, her experience uh, working in Wuhan and how can we learn sharing the ideas of the, and the concepts that they have. cities. So um, I don't know if you can see clearly on this picture, this is a, a map of the Hubei province. So um, it's, it's, it is an old map, so it, it, it doesn't make sense actually. So it just draw all the mountains and all the rivers. So Hubei means the north of the, the lake which is very big um, and it has a lot of lakes. So here, um, this is the Yangtze River. It goes from this way and it goes this way and down and this way. So um, actually the, the Yangtze River make a little W shape in the middle, in the central part of China. So, and this is the biggest tributary of the river. So this part is Hankou. This part is Hanyang, 
and this part is Wu Chang. So uh, talking about the relationship be between the city and the lake, I think there are four phases. So, um, so I'm here to talk about the strategies, but the strategies started really early because the city always changes and the strategies are um, somehow it, it continues. So uh, the first one, also in a little bit background information about the three cities. This is uh, Hanyang, uh, the original city which had a history of more than 1800 years. So um, this is Hankou, originally a port city. So um, there's a little thing. Um, before the Ming Dynasty, which is the, I think it's in the 16th century, um, the Han River, the biggest tributary, has moved the last time. So th after the diversion of the city, uh, uh, of the river, Hankou formed. And Han Yang, Yang, um, although most of you are not Chinese, but I think you've heard this word, Yang and Yin. So Yin Yang is, is, is something that like, nowadays everybody knows. But re reflecting it on the map, so the, the south part, uh, the south um, part of the uh, a mountain is called Yang because the sun shines. Yang is the sun. And the north part of the uh, mountain is called Yin because uh, it, it's the shade. Yin means the shade. But it's different on the rivers. So the, the north bank of the river is called Yang. And the south bank of the river is called Yin. And Hanyang was originally at the north bank, but after the diversion, it becomes the south bank. So here is, is after the 16th century, um, we have the Hanko now. So here, this is the Yangtze River. This is the city wall, but the city wall is kind of interesting. Um, you know, China has a lot of walled cities, but not this one. This one is not built by any um, um, government. This is built by the people. And it only lasted for uh, several decades, no longer than 100 years, because um, the city need to expand. Um, and so this is Wuchang, so at the, this part, at this part of, of the river, uh, just across the Yangtze River. Um, thinking of, Thinking of the Yangtze River, I don't know if anyone has been to any part of the Yangtze River. I, I think a lot of you do. So um, the Yangtze River in Wuhan is, is kind of wide, how wide. Um, if you take the metro now, uh, it takes you four minutes to cross the river. And it is um, like a thousand meters, no, 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 I, found, I, I, I forgot. So it's, it's I'm sorry, it's, it's four minutes by metro. So it's, it's wide. And so these isolated cities, um, so look, so here is the river, and this is a little walled city, and they have a little mountains over here, a lot of lakes. Nowadays, uh, Wuhan has over a hundred lakes in the city. And the city is, is, is huge. Um, it is um, the urban places and the, the, and the rural places together, it makes uh, 260 Macau's. So that's, that's a huge. So um, we have this picture is, is, is it's clear that they, they, they have a wall, and this is the river bank. This is other rivers, rivers. And here, the, they have ports here. So um, 
before the before the Hankou was opened as a treaty port, these three cities developed at their own pace. And Wuchang, so this place, is um, has a something here. Maybe someone you know. There's uh, there is a yellow crane tower. The yellow crane tower has um, been built and rebuilt several times. Originally, um, maybe the the first one over a hundred thousand years, and then it, the last one, the one you can see now, it's it's built in 1985 with an elevator in it, and and it's ridiculous. Yeah, but it's 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 here in the in the late Qing Dynasty, and originally. This one is used as a military tower. So Wu Chang, Chang means prosperous, Wu means military. So um, this this place is very famous for it's hard to be occupied because of the river. So at this pace, um, the rivers is the borders of the isolated cities, but then. So the city um, becomes like now uh, one step after another. So this is um, in the late Qing Dynasty. You can see this little walled city, this little walled city, and this one. So it goes this way. So this is Han, and this is a drawing, a picture of the three towns. So this. Um, this is how they they look at the picture. Um, in the ancient Chinese maps, the north side is 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 down is down there, and the this is the south side. Okay, so it's different than now. And now, after 1961, the city started to move to uh, its. Modern times. So first in 1981, the Britain had had its concession, and then uh, German, and uh, and then Germany, and then Russia, and then Japan. So they have four uh, concessions here. Originally, so the the red part is the uh, is is the British concession. Originally, it, it wanted to put the concession area here because originally this is the, the, the white place is originally town and it's a port city. It is very, um, uh, a lot of ships. Yeah, so they, they want to tear, tear, tear down all the houses here and the government is said, no, you need to find a new place. So here, as the river goes this way, this this is kind of uh, the first city which had a downtown area in China, because now, nowadays, to now, people say this is the down area, this is the up area. So this is downtown, and this is the um, a good place to visit now because we have a lot of shared built heritage because of the concessions, and um, so, but. So this is also the uh, concession areas, but let me introduce this one. This is Zhang Zhidong. Um, I would say he is the first planner of Wuhan. He was one of the four um, very famous uh, person in the late Qing Dynasty who uh, was uh, very eager to ha to make China uh, more stronger, so it's it's called the Westernization movement. So he was one of it, uh, one of it, and he came to Wuhan and stayed there for 18 years. During these 18 years, he has done the first plan of Wuhan and uh, make it a industrial city and and make the three towns, three isolated towns, into a a bigger one. So look at this one. This is um, 
an iron uh, factory and gunpowder factory, and this is the port. So uh, through the uh, Han River and the Yangtze River, they can ship it to uh, some other places. And what makes it a little uh, ironic is um, he wanted to make the Qing Dynasty powerful. So he made this um, iron company. He produces gunpowders. He wants to fight against those foreigners. But um, the, in 1911, there's the Wuchang uprising, which get the Qing Dynasty away. And they used the guns that he produced. They used the gunpowder he produced. And they, and yeah, and the, the most ironic thing is the Qing Dynasty's, um, the, the, the governors, they got on a train, which uh, the, the rails are made by his factory. So he kind of ended the things he, he, he loved, but he, he was the first planner. So let's see this picture. He had these factories um, alongside this river. So here is Hanko, and this place is the downtown area. This is the concession area. And um, here uh, is uh, a, ne a needle factory, um, arsenal, an iron factory. Here's a paper mill, a silk factory, a cloth factory, a, and all kinds of these factories and here. So look at these two railways and they are all um, designed by him. So the first one, this one is the Jinghan Railway. The Jing uh, refers to Beijing, the capital. Han is Wuhan. And this is, uh, it's called the Yuehan, fact, uh, Yuehan uh, Railway. Yue is Guangdong, and Han is also Wuhan. So it goes from Wuchang all the way to Guangzhou. So he tried to link the, the whole China and Wuhan is, is the heart because here we don't have anything. He, uh, those days they, they need a ferry to carry the trains from, from this side to this side. So um, he, he planned the first uh, Yangtze River Bridge and he planned uh, all these, all these factories and these uh, ports. So here is the Hanko port because of the concession. And he wants to make China stronger. Okay, so he had these, um, these ports in Wuchang. And also he built a lot of dikes along the river to make this, the city safer. And then it moves to the third phase. Like after the Wuchang's uprising, um, this, uh, this famous man, uh, Sun Yat-sen, he, uh, he was considered a doctor here, right? And he, he was the first uh, um, president of the Republic of China. And he made these, all these plans of China, and Wuhan is an important city. So uh, after him, there's a lot of plans connecting the city, and then after 1949, there's a lot of plans in the city. Um, the main thing is to expand the city and to link the city. And the, to link the city in 19... Um, in 1957, which is 60 years before, the first the Yangtze River Bridge finally done. And so strategies now for the, uh, for the SDGs, we have um, this thing planned. So nowadays we have nine bridges on the river and then we have this, this is called the the, the Changjiang axis, the Yangtze River axis. So
So here is the, the main part of the city. Um, and this, the, the, the red area is the starter and then to the black area and then to the blue area. They want to have this, this place as the most important place of the city. Um, it, formerly, it's called the scenic uh, spot of the Jianghan Chaozong. It's, it, it, it's like the central part, uh, the central park of Wuhan, but only bigger. But nowadays, it, it's, it's not only a scenic spot, it, it's, it's the heart of the city. And then um, here is another strategy. Uh, it's, it's called the, uh, the Changjiang New Town. The New Town because we have uh, three towns and this is the fourth. And um, these things, um, so we have this um, SDG 11 here. And uh, the thing I, need, uh, I really want to print out, uh, point out is the, the Changjiang Axis. It is very easy to, uh, to access for people to get in, for people to uh, have interactions with different people, with different generations, and it's echo, uh, it, it's green, and it's, um, it, it, can, it can give you a good opportunity to get involved in culture activities, things like that, and uh, now they have a very good policy to have um, the newly graduate students, newly graduate um, students to, you know, in the house race in China is flying. So they, they, have, they, they will give the newly graduates 20% uh, off in, in that area, in this area, in the new town. So they can have their um, they, they can have their place to live, which is is important for a city which is always expanding. The new uh, the new people, you know, because of the one child policy, there's not enough uh, young people in China, and we really need young people in the city, right? So um, they, they got twenty percent off. So, and this place, this picture is another important thing, it, uh, which is, um, so throughout all these years, all those concession areas and other historical areas, we finally uh, ha meet the point that we need to protect them. Nowadays, they are dismantling everything, they, they tear down everything, and it, it's bad. So we have this this plan. We have uh, so the red is called the historical and cultural blocks. The yellow is called the historical sites, and the the blue one is called the traditional streets. So all these areas they need to uh, preserve, and and we can see this also at the banks. So also we have the new urban agenda, which uh, has a lot of things I don't really need the time to explain. But um, also it, needs, uh, it, sh it shows that we need to think about the city, how we can we design for its future. So for me, it's like um, we need to think about the new generations, how they can find jobs in the city, uh, how they can get links to the to the history of the city and how they can live uh, in the city without um, hesitating uh, who is going to pay the next rent. So um, it makes the city sustainable and habitable. So, and this is the end, thank you. I'm sorry, I'm a little nervous. Thank you. So now we pass to our next speaker, Wallace, please. Uh, Wallace Chang is awarded architect, social activist, and theorist of, on urban design, cultural conservation, and community participation. 
his latest research focused on cultural identity and sustainability issues during the urban transformation process in Hong Kong and southern Chinese cities. Welcome, Wallace Chang. I just try to open up my PowerPoint, but uh, maybe I need some help from the... Wallace Chang is gonna help you. <laughs> Thank you, Maria, for inviting me to be here. And um, yeah, <laughs> just push it. Right. Okay. I think uh, I don't know why Hong Kong is a river city. Maybe it's not a river city, but I think because when people think about Hong Kong, it's more like a harbor, right? I think it's harbor is the but. In a way, when I think about further, about how we are being related, Hong Kong, Macau, and the region, actually we are all connected by water. I would say framing as a water, because some of the water is fresh, some of the water is salted. And this picture actually is from my own apartment, from my window, going, looking out from, uh, from my window. I think it's, uh, it's partially an open sea, but it's partially a river. It's called the uh, Satin River and Satin Sea somehow. It used to be a sea, but now it become a river. And um, interestingly enough, people started to love it. So they started up piling up the rocks and put a hut there. Interesting. So I think river has a kind of attachment to people and people has attachment to the river as well. So let, let's look at this. <coughs> the world, this part of the world, right? So you can see this is the, the cities in the region where lots of people actually is living around the coast. And also here, Hong Kong in the middle. Yeah. Yeah, this is working. No, okay, so I go back again, all right? So this is how we see this region in a way. Uh, if we have this global picture, all the cities actually is connected by the bigger body sea, the ocean, and then smaller connection through the rivers, and probably in this region, the delta. <coughs> so this is the delta, right? I think it's very obvious. Uh, maybe I stand up to point. <laughs> the delta here, if we point to three things, this is Macau, Hong Kong, and Guangzhou. This is a triangle here. So we call the Pearl River Delta. Nowadays, they, we call what, uh, the, the GBA, Great, <laughs> Great Bay Area, we pla replace it. But, but anyway, I think it's the same thing for me, but definitely it's different politically. And I think the difference here is because in the past, probably there's no holistic urban planning because each of the cities developed by themselves. And those cities actually is connected because of two things. One is the blue area that means the river, the delta, and the sea. Secondly, it's about <coughs> because they, they are, are kind of connected in some sense um, because of culture. Because in the past, those people living together, they share the same culture, basically the same language, and particularly the Pao language, right? So in Cantonese, the Pao language is the most famous thing in, throughout China. But now I think with this big idea of the GBA, the Grand Bay Area concept, I think that means we work together, we kind of plan together. So this is a kind of agenda which has been posted by the central government, which is good and bad. I think good thing is we can really coordinate with each other, right? So before that, I think this region has been planned together to a certain extent, but the focus actually has been forgotten about the water. You can see all those road networks, right? This, the, the gray one actually are road networks, was, which was built in the last 20, 30 years. 
because this region was separated by river. So if you, I think some of you are old enough, right, <laughs> to travel, say, from Zhongshan to Guangzhou, it, it takes a long time because you have to cross all these rivers and then go to the major city. So that's the reason why in the last 20, 30 years, the government, Chinese government, tried to build up the network here. So today we can drive within three hours in the whole region, which is good for the production, for the industries, right? But at the same time, something has, for, has been forgotten. How about the river? Because the river at this moment of time actually is used as discharges for the industries. So uh, most of the water bodies are being polluted. Okay, going back to our history, this is a picture that was, I, I found it in Boston when I was studying there, and which is exported from Guangzhou, because at that moment they call these kind of pictures Hong Hua, right? Which is, means uh, a very you know, ordinary or kind of uh, for business purpose. They paint it every day and then just like some painting in Taipan village in Shenzhen. So they export it to, uh, to America, to Europe and, and all these thing, places. But interesting enough, in this picture, which is portraying this area, this region's ideal living style, you can see the pavilions, houses, pagoda, the boat and the river in front, right, definitely, and a farm here. And you can also see some people. Those people, which is very interesting. One, this is the scholar, right? You can see this is scholar, some of the professors here. And at the same time, definitely have a teaching assistant so to carry the books, right? So this is the, um, the, the assistant. But at the same time, there are also farmers here. What does it mean? That means two things. This is the ideal living style. This is the ideal living conditions, which, is, which may exist or just imaginary. May not be true, but this is the ideal picture of living in this area. That means you have river, you have water, you have a boat, you have a, you know, all your farms, and sometimes you can be farmers, and sometimes you can be scholars. Reason, I think, uh, I think it's a reason, uh, re very interesting picture in, in the mind, because today, as a scholar, we can never study forever, right? Sometimes we have to be farmers. That means we have to go into practice. We have to really devote our body and our soul to produce. But this kind of cultural tradition actually is, is kind of losing. So what is in reality today is the real Pearl River Delta because of industrialization. We build the highways, right? These highways cutting across all these lands. I mean, there are rivers actually all around, but they started to build up factories next to the villages, right? New towns actually popping up. So this kind of ideal situation because of the modernization, actually is losing, losing its own flavor. So, looking at Hong Kong, this is the territory of Hong Kong. Hong Kong actually is very small, right? Very small. Across the border is Shenzhen, this you can see. Across the border is highly urbanized, highly urbanized. And, but there's a big vast of land, which is counting to about 75% of the territory, which we call green. That means the city actually is happening in this 20% of the harbor and you know, some of the new towns here. And one thing which is very interesting, if we look at the original settlements, this is the, one of the original settlements still surviving, which is called Tai O, right? Look at this picture, at this corner here, at the far tip of Hong Kong. But it is one of those stopping points for the fishermen, actually, because if we look at the territory as a triangle, so this is one of the stopping important port, I mean, for the local fishermen here. So this is how it looks like. Interesting enough, you can interpret that as a mini age of Hong Kong, because how, it, how the water comes into the community and how it goes out, right? So you can look at the, why they choose this location, because the river comes in, from two ends, from the sea, and the river actually from the mountain up here, so it's like a triangle. Maybe we can also interpret it as a mediation of uh, Wuhan, right? So, I think it's strategically wise happen when pick location, even though it's a very small town. But I 
think it's interesting when we look at how river, water, and how people live and survive. I think there are formulas of people choosing sites to settle. Okay, looking at Hong Kong again. Not far away is 1930. This is the picture of the harbor. You can see lots of boats actually in the harbor, right? There's lots of boats here. The harbor is more frequently used. And then in the 70s, because of the industrialization, right? Most of the buildings are getting bigger, but less boats. And further on, no more boats on the harbor. I mean, just very few ferries, but, but lots, lots of buildings. buildings. That means the city goes beyond, or they don't depend much on the water anymore, but depends on the land. But how about the future? We, we're not sure. When we talk about water as not just a transportation, but water as culture, what does it mean? How can we look at it this way? But in a way, I'm not sure how water can be something that can save the city, because in Hong Kong, people tend to forget, right? So I call it a, I mean, a ninja city. So that means we forget. Why? Because there's lots of symptoms, lots of diseases. These are the urban symptoms that I, I consider the city because the growth, they think, equals to urbanization and the community sense is diminishing and the time and distance is compressed. That means people getting faster and the distance doesn't matter, right? And the lack of local identity and the landscape becomes generic. That means no character. So these are urban symptoms which has been witnessed in Hong Kong. Probably is coming to Macau, I think, because <coughs> this is the situation. Because even building has been built in different generations. You can see tall buildings, small buildings. You know some of those built in the 60s, some in the 80s, etc. But one very simple formula those buildings has been developed in the past is this. This is the developer's formula. Very simple. Get a piece of land, pot ratio, and then you build, and da 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 is the same, right? I think it's happening in Macau. This is the, I, I call it the developer's formula. You don't need architects, right? <laughs> Easy. So this is the result, right? Okay. Coming back to Hong Kong, yeah, I've been criticizing it, but it has a unique urban form of itself. This is a quote from a very famous urbanist um, from MIT, Kevin Lynch. He said, city forms, the actual function and the idea and values that people attach to them make up a single phenomenon. That means maybe a city is not so good, maybe it's so bad, Hong Kong is not so good, maybe not, not so bad, but it's unique. Macau is unique. Malacca is unique because of the people, because of how they think, how they do, and how they value things. So, if we change people's mind from that urban symptom, I think we can build a livable city, which also depends on water, right? How are we going to do it? This is my solution. This is my strategy, right? The first strategy is how are we going to apply sustainability? Because in the past, most of the people, maybe some people here, talk about sustainability, but it's always providing lip service. But how to provide that applied, that means sustainability really goes onto the land, right? Secondly, how are we going to rebuild neighborhoods, right? Thirdly, I think easy mobility is something which is essential in Hong Kong. You can move easily, right? Thirdly, I think we have to rebuild the local identity. And the fifth point, which I would like to focus today, is about human landscape, which I invented the term. Um, one quotation, this is one example that we look into, which is in Seoul, South Korea. This is because South Korea is famous for two things, right? One is the, the plastic surgery, right? And this is one of the plastic surgery in town. This is before and this is after of a, a very famous project called Chin Kai Chun, this area, a river inside the city. So. I think they, they, they call a very interesting example of urban transformation. By putting, we introduce the river back to the city, the city become alive. This is exactly some, hap I mean, if you take this photograph here, you may see, oh, this is Hong Kong somewhere in the busy street, maybe now it's happening in Macau as well. But how can this become that? I think this is the magic of the Korean, right? Uh, 
uh, ugly girl can be quite beautiful after that, right? So this is also something that uh, very attractive to the urban dwellers because the urban river actually is not just water, but it's life. This is life. You find life inside a city. So they are demonstrating something which is magical for me, and that actually inspired me a lot. So this is the result in a very highly densified situation, but at the same time, it can be quite interesting. At the same time, people really love it, right? And I think why people in this region actually is attracted, but at the same time, people think together. This is another example, which is in Guangzhou. Uh, a, a few years ago, because when I was thinking about a project in Hong Kong, I was thinking, and in Guangzhou, because of the Chinese speed, they already done it, right? So in a way, we are not complicating, but I mean, China, China people work faster than Hong Kong people 10 times, and maybe 20 times faster than Macau people, right? So <laughs> there's a professor in a South China University. They kind of conceive it, and then they did it within half a year because I think of two reasons. One is at that moment because of the, uh, I think the um, Asian game is coming into the city. So there's a planner who make use of that, this opportunity to persuade the government, say, okay, let's take out the river again. And this become reality within half a year. So this is the, how it looks like. I think one of the beauty here is the river actually become a public space as well as it's a rediscovery of the history because the river actually connecting all those historical points because it used to be a river. Somehow some, some people recover it and now they rediscover it following the same formula of the Qing Tai Chuan in South Korea. But one thing more interesting here is because the river is a connection of all the historical spots. Something like the, the trail, a parallel trail in, in uh, Right. So here, along the river, there's no boundary. You can really up, walk up and becoming coming to some historical buildings and also public grounds, etc. So, which is very interesting. But at the same time, it's also painful because when it's being transformed, I was told, people started to complain when there's a construction right next to you. Right? People kind of go, "How do they trust the government? You know, every every day there are, you know, construction going on and." and so on and so forth, right? So there's lots of complaints about this, but in the end, when it's completed, so this is some of the historical building next to it, so that is kind of something similar to Malacca. Instead of looking at the back of it, so facing it. I think, this, I think this is a very interesting attitude, maybe the biggest strategy, look at problems in front, not at the back, right? So. After this completed, people celebrated, and this gentleman here, you see this gentleman here, it's called Wang Yang, right? It's promoted to central, and yesterday, or two days before, become higher in the officials. I think it's partially contributing because of that. And interestingly enough, it's just an environmental improvement that becomes a political, you know, kind of achievement for the politicians. Definitely I'm not following that track. What I want to do is, can we really regenerate memorable urban soul of a place, right? Say in Hong Kong. I think there are three elements I, I would like to advocate. One is we have to respect the indigenous landscape. That means if there's a river, we should keep it as a river. We discover it. If there's a mountain, we, we think about this as a mountain. Secondly is how are we going to make use of the local culture of the territory. And thirdly, I think which is very important, sometimes we forgotten, is because of what, we, what I call a preem human nature. That means I love beautiful things, not because me, I think he also loves beautiful things, right? It's cool, we feel coolness, right? I feel coolness, he feels coolness because we are human beings. Simply because they are human natures. So in this case, I think Maybe we have to think in this way and see as local people, as the community, what we can do. So this is my attempt in one part of Hong Kong, which I call Kai Tet River, because there's no, there's no such 
River in Hong Kong. I, this is the name I, I, I invented. Nobody called this. I call it Kaita River. In fact, the official name is Kaita Naula. That means channel, right? Officially. And I call it Kaita River, uh, I think about, about 10, 12 years ago. Talking to the officials, this is a river. And they say, no, 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 this is a laula. I said, no, 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 this is a river. Is it? I mean, it's because by changing the name, the concept changed. River is clean. River has lots of uh, you know, life. River is something that we love. Laula is something at the back, right? River is something in the front. So I invented this name, and this I published this book. And the location of the river, actually, this is a Kaita airport, the airport which we're not using anymore. The river actually is somewhere here. And <clears throat> along the river, somehow there's lots of uh, historical um, spots because this is the first location here before reclamation. This is the first location here. The British actually meet the Chinese because the town was there, the Kowloon Wall City was there. So in one day I did this sketch the blue one is what we call the river, and around this is, is some of the spots and also, also the green connections. This is very imaginary because this is not official, this is my own sketch. And I pinpoint about 16 points. Uh, at that moment, it's a dream, just like okay, an architect's dream, right? Nobody paid for me, but I just got, meet some local leaders and, oh, we have this dream. They, they have dreams, you know, but I have also a pen. I go, okay, tell me your dream and draw your dreams on the plan. So this is how we kind of uh, work together. And these are the 16 points along the dream. And after about 12 years, I think we realizing 14 of those points. The first point is to rename it, right? Strategically, it is already there. So because of that, I tried to investigate and also look into the history. So this is a sketch by the British Army. So, and then I look at it, oh, this is a real river here. Actually, there's a river along this edge. There was a river, but not as the same as here. And in fact, this is a laula which was built by the Japanese soldier during the World War II for, for urban sewage, right? So this is all with concrete something similar to the Malacca situation, but which is very narrow. Uh, nobody really cares about this. But then, because a few years ago, the government changed the water quality, so the birds comes back, I mean, the, the fish comes back, the birds comes back, and it still is quite channelized, right? But with lots of trees around it. So I led a group of students doing some imaginations, proposals, etc. This is in 2007 around the, the area, what can we do about this? This is some models. And then we extended this idea to a further connection with the territory. And then we, I, I went to the schools, to the community to advocate water is good, right? And this is something that we should put treasure inside the city. So try to brainwash them a little bit. So then I published some books again, and also doing some exhibitions. And this is the real picture, not Photoshop, because you see the density of the, of the fish inside the river, uh, because this is the river, I mean, is being clean again, and the, the fish actually swims back. And then we did some artistic installation there. So this is the real setting. I lit a group of students doing the, what we call a windmill, putting onto the river and suddenly transform the blackish river into very colorful um, kind of installation. And this is Photoshop to convince the government, please give me more money and I can do, do better for you, right? Okay, the birds comes back. And the natural habitat actually is the strongest lesson that we learn. And because we did basically nothing but nature comes back. And because nature comes back, people also comes back. People look into the river. These are, these are all school kids. They look into the river and see if they can fish some fishes there. Actually, this is what they fish. And they started to install some of those 
animals they find around the river and put it into insulation. This is my imagination a few years ago. What can be done? Very minimal, right? Just improve uh, the surrounding a little bit. I mean, the cost of that is less than one tower to transform the whole river. Um, yeah, definitely it's not as such. Now it's like this. Because in the end, we persuade the government to really beautify it, right? To really modify it and, and let the birds have a resting place. And I mean, the, the construction is still going on. But definitely, I think this one thing that we change is changing people's mind, which is very important. If I say there's a strategy, it's to, stra to, to strategize people's mind, which is very important, at the same time, very critical. Because when people change their mind, things will be changed. Otherwise, nothing will be changed. So, this is my wish, because sometimes we think the moon is quite far, or, or maybe we're big, right? And we, we imagine our land can be cultivated like this, like a farm. But I think in between this heaven and earth, something happened, right? City can live between the two. So this is my only wish, and hopefully this can be extended somewhere else. Okay, this is my end of the presentation. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. It's your wish, and it's so also our wish. Um, so every, anybody who wants to, we have now room for some questions from the audience. Please feel free to talk with us and also our other lecturers will join us. I enjoy very much your talk, Professor, uh, this one. And uh, uh, really, uh, what we need is to have livable cities where people uh, interface and have cohesion social cohesion and create the places for this social cohesion to happen. So we have in one side the speculation of the market pulling up out of uh, narrow little corners high rise, people looking into other people's kitchens. I mean, there is no interface, really human interface uh, with the uh, Today's computers and uh, digital age, everybody uh, is in front of the screens. Atomization of people. So we need social cohesion. We need the squares to work. And uh, so in 1975, I just recall, I proposed a Praia Grande. I was uh, quite naive at that time. Uh, but it was between the Lisboa Hotel and the uh, Bella Vista, where is the embassy. And there was a lake, a one lake with a park between the Lisboa and uh, Bella Vista. And the uh, uh, pedestrian area all around, all around for the communities to interface. At, and then a very s slope, soft slope to the lake. And then we would recreate the old Praia Grande uh, with the two-story buildings just for uh, terrace cafes or boutiques or something uh, livable. So no monstrosities, no heavy uh, concrete uh, uh, blocks, you know. And then behind we had the, the trees and then the 15-story buildings actually uh, some of these reputable architects uh, had started building high-rise, in fact, blocking the, the Peña uh, Hill uh, Church. Uh, <laughs> I don't mention which one, you know. And also, they were able, the same ones, were able to block some of our sightseeing uh, sceneries there were, we have some gazebos in the Barra area also blocked with the buildings above that area in Praia Grande and the Engineer Trigo area. So just to see that 
to have in mind to create the town for the people, not for the developers and speculators, please. Yes, I'm sorry. Can I okay, answer just question? Yes. Be, be short. Yes, very short. Uh, maybe either to, to yourself or to Jean-Paul. As you know, uh, the access to the river in Macau is almost blocked, it's blocked. 100 yeah. percent, right? Yeah. So what can we do to make it more open, accessible to, to the people? Yeah. yeah. So we, we can learn a little bit with uh, your experiences. And uh, the, the project of Manuel Vicente was a very nice project and a very nice approach that in a certain way kept the connection between people and the river. Also, we learned from Wuhan how to do it. And finally, also with uh, your wish, uh, we, we are sensitive to it. But now uh, we want to see and uh, to learn a little bit more of your, um, of your position facing this uh, question. Uh, okay, maybe I start then. And just to uh, give some heads up on, the, on this issue. Currently, I have to say, and despite the, 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 the project or the plan that I have presented earlier, that the public space in general in Macau has been more and more neglect, neglected. Uh, it has been, been in a very furious transformation into something that uh, we don't recognize ourselves in the public space in Macau anymore. So, of course, we need to reflect and think about what we will want for a public space in Macau. And that addresses uh, the riverfront in the inner harbor all the way down, uh, where actually you can't access the river just like once before. You, you had only in, s in single locations. And, um, and there should be a plan to think about, about, uh, about public spaces and the way the public interact with the city because nowadays we have been losing it. Yeah. So I, I would like just to say uh, something because when I met, first uh, time we met was in uh, Wuhan and uh, Wuhan is uh, the first time I thought about the river cities and about the importance of having a river and the relation between people and water. Of course, I think about this every day. But then organizing a conference, inviting uh, people from Wuhan to share with us their experience. Because the city is huge, the city is very nice, there's a lot of lakes and ponds in here and there. And we can recognize that in the urban planning for the future, everything is taken into account. So the relation between people and water. In Macau, we suffer a lot because we are divorced from the river. So tell us a little bit about. Um, I would like to say a little bit more because uh, Wuhan, especially Hankou, um, suffered from the water a lot in the old days. So, um, you know, the, the Yangtze River, they have big flood almost every year. And you can see this from the TV that the river gets really high and the people, um, it, it, the whole city gets flooded. Um, so, but nowadays they, they, they did the embankment uh, like several uh, stages. So in, the, uh, in winter, the water was low and it, you, they, they grow something on the bank. And in, the, in summer, um, they have those uh, temporary uh, swimming pools on, on the bank. So they just, um, I think it's, it, it's a smart way to do it. They just have some, some, some guards watching there and they, they, they tied the, the, the lines on, on the trees. You know, the, the trees is usually very high, but in summer, it, it's kind of, the, the, the water is at the neck of the tree. So people can swim there. And um, so it makes like uh, it makes the river accessible. It, it it's uh, in every year, and they organize uh, across Yangtze River uh, 
competition. Because, uh, um, you know, Chairman Mao, he once swam through it. So, like, people uh, do this uh, every year now. And I think this is um, interesting because if you encourage people to do something and the people will focus on it more and it, it becomes more accessible. And another example I really want to say is um, because we have more than 100 uh, lakes in the city, lakes is also very important. It's, 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 it's water, right? So um, between the, the biggest lake and the second biggest lake in the Wuchang area, uh, originally these lakes are connected to the, the, the river, but then uh, it's not. Uh, nowadays, we reconnected them to the, to the river and it makes uh, the environment better. And also, um, I think this is a very smart way to do, um, so th they made a canal and they call it a river and they use the very famous Chinese phrase, uh, it's Chu He Han Jie. It, it means a border, and then they change only one word. It's called Chu He Han Jie. So they, they 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 kind of invented a river called Chu He because we live in the Chu uh, Chu area of China, and Han Jie Han means Wuhan, and Jie they, they build a commercial street, so people go there to shop and they go to the river, they can walk to it, and they, can, they have little ferries in it uh, between those uh, uh, two big lakes. And then it, it's accessible, and, and people focus on that. People go there every weekend to, to have fun. So I think this is, like, you need to be um, convincing to, to, to talk to the government. I want to have this river and, but you can benefit from it because you have the street. Yeah, it's a public space. I, I think one, and to answer one question for, one answer to two questions, I think is, is how we change people's mind. I think this is the most important. I think from the experience I'm having, actually, I was dreaming about all these things, right? And, but strategically, we talked to, because I am an architect, I, I don't know how to deal with the water, right? But there are people who knows how to deal with the water. It's the, it's the hydraulic engineers, it's the government people, and also the community, the school kids, actually. They love the river in the end. By allowing the students to love the river and allowing those engineers to help you, because I brainwash them a little bit, because they keep telling me this is a Kaita Laula. I say, no, 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 this is Kaita River. And the third time when I meet those guys, you know, engineers, they say, oh, this is Kaita River. And culture is very important. I say, oh, surprisingly, engineers can talk like this. Because I think it's very important for, I mean, the, the whole experience that I'm having, actually, is this not, the river is not the most important. It is the community education how we educate the community, or vice versa, how the community will educate me as advocacy, as an advocate to change people's mind, as well as using the river as a means to connect the city again. Because I think it was dividing, as according to some of the theory, it can be a divider or it can be a sipper, right? So now it becomes a sipper, as well as, I would say, a generator of momentum. This momentum is for people to imagine the possibilities. So I think in the process, I, I try to leave lots of uh, unknowns, not, not try to design too much, because if you design too much, people may say yes, people may say no, right? If you are just providing a possibility for people, even the school kids can contribute. I think this is very important. The river has this kind of quality of connection, connecting both different water bodies, as well as connecting the communities. I think this is the magic of that, right? Yeah. In, uh, in our situation, unfortunately, the river is dividing communities. In one side, Macau, the other side, China. So the river is really the border, uh, the, the, the difference between both sides. And we want this because all, all this is China, finally. So we are in the Delta River. And the river, that's why the, the Portuguese and Occidental life 
suddenly came to China, suddenly came here by the sea, and then using the river to penetrate in the interior because it was the open avenue by that time. So we want this to, to be uh, true again. And the, the, the river as means of communication is very important. And what we understood here today is since the past, since the piracy, <laughs> since the pirates, and since the, also the experiences from uh, Malaysia, Ipoh, Malacca, and so on, and also the, the, um, some situations here in Macau, the city can grow even though keeping the relation with the city, the Praia Grand Bay, the experience of Wuhan, your experience. So uh, I would like to thank you all because it was a great uh, experience for all of us also to listen to you and to understand your points and to have this kind of brainstorm about the relation between the city, the people and the water. Thank you so much for everybody. I think we are.